maybe we should get started. Can everybody except um, Douglas, myself, and Shamit mute themselves, please, now? I'll give you a chance to do that. Everybody, please, mute. thank you. Um, okay, so first we're going to have an announcement by our esteemed chair, Shamit, and then we'll get going on the colloquium. Okay, well, welcome. Today's going to be a really exciting colloquium. It's our first and perhaps last colloquium of the quarter. And before the talk, we also have the privilege of introducing today the winners of uh, this quarter's Kirkpatrick Award. So this award was established to recognize graduate students who've demonstrated a talent for and commitment to teaching of physics undergrads, and therefore sort of exemplify the dual commitment to teaching and research that was characteristic of Paul Kirkpatrick in his own career. He was a distinguished member of our own physics department for 28 years before retiring in 1960. Um, he was well known for x-ray research for the invention of the x-ray microscope and for pioneering work in scientific holography, though not the kind of holography that Douglas may talk about in his colloquium. Um, he's also really famous for his spirited championship of the importance of furthering excellence in the teaching of physics. Uh, his strength of character, integrity, and compassion were much admired by his colleagues, and this award was established in his honor um, after he died in 1998. So the award recipients for last quarter were Will DeRocco for his teaching in the Physics 40 and 60 series, Tina Narong for Physics 45 and 107, and Dylan Ruder for his teaching in Physics 20, the 20 series, the 40 series, and the 60 series. So this announcement was just to recognize their great contributions to our teaching of undergraduates. And with that, I'll pass it back to Eva to introduce today's speaker. Well, let, let's clap for those, those folks. Um, okay, so... Let's start. So today we're really delighted to have our own Douglas Stanford as our spring colloquium speaker, who will single-handedly carry forward our tradition of gathering as a department to enjoy a piece of exciting physics. So no pressure or anything, Douglas. Um, so Douglas recently joined our faculty about a year ago after a stint as a, as a long-term member at the Institute for Advanced Study following his PhD here at Stanford in 2014. His research has been recognized, for example, with a New Horizons Prize and a Gruber Prize. Douglas and his collaborators have made major contributions to the study of quantum chaos, theoretical black hole physics, and relations between them, including a landmark set of calculations that he and others did this past year, which I think is what he'll share with you today. So um, please interrupt with questions, especially non-experts, because uh, otherwise he may feel like he's talking to himself, and I don't think he has cabin fever that badly yet. So <laughs> with that, uh, take it away, Douglas. OK, thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. I'm going to share my screen. And uh, OK. OK, so thanks for the opportunity to speak. And thanks to everybody for coming to um, this talk. I'd just like to um, reinforce what Eva said. I would really like it if people would not be shy about interrupting to ask questions. We could only this experience better for everybody, uh, especially me. Okay, so there's an amazing idea that has been powering a lot of insights in high energy theoretical physics um, for decades now. Um, and that idea is that from a distance, a black hole behaves like an ordinary quantum system, um, one with many degrees of freedom and strong interactions, but a conventional um, quantum mechanical system. And this idea is, well, it's still sort of a conjecture, but it's passed many tests. Um, and the way a test works is that you show that a black hole successfully reproduces some phenomenon that would be exhibited by an ordinary quantum system with many degrees of freedom and strong interactions. And here's a list of some of the tests, a partial list of some of the tests that have been passed, going back to work of Bekenstein and, the Hawking, and Bekenstein and Hawking in the 70s and continuing until quite recently. And these tests are quite challenging. Like, I don't know, on average, it takes, um, we get one or two of these per decade or something in uh, high energy theory work. Um, but I want to particularly highlight this characterization that the black holes pass the test in kind of a simple and surprising way. So if you think about a quantum system with many degrees of freedom and strong interactions, we don't really have tools for analyzing those systems directly. But there are some properties that are so fundamental that you can kind of almost feel them in your bones. 
like the fact that these systems approach equilibrium or the fact that small perturbations um, relax or the butterfly effect. These are properties that normally you can't really compute directly in a complicated quantum system. But one of the amazing things about the black hole is that black holes manifest these phenomena, but they do so in a way that is also simple. And so they give a, a computable theory where you can see uh, with paper and pencil calculations, um, these basic phenomena take place. So actually my favorite example of this, it's, it's this one, thermalization. And um, so the problem of thermal, one, one way of saying it is you take some system and you poke it a little bit and the poke sort of disappears into the thermal soup. And this is one of these things that you can feel in your bones, but you can't show directly in, um, in most quantum systems or even classical systems. Boltzmann had a nightmare with that. Um, but in a black hole, here's how it works. A perturbation is just a particle that you introduce near the black hole. And the thermalization is the particle falling into the black hole. It's as simple and beautiful as that. Okay, but there are a few, um, there are a few properties of ordinary quantum systems that so far um, black holes have not been able to replicate or until recently, anyhow, they have not been able to replicate. And these, this problem or this tension um, goes by the name of the black hole information problem. And in the last few years, um, progress has been made, not complete progress, but some progress has been made in understanding aspects of these problems. Um, and one thing that sort of unites all of the different types of progress that's been made is that wormholes play a leading role. So wormholes are going to be the theme of this talk. And I'm going to descri describe three ways that they've um, sort of helped us think about different versions of the black hole information problem. So um, these three are sort of a selection, but uh, I believe they're deeply related, that the wormholes are are deeply related to each other in the three cases, but I don't understand their relation very well. So I'll present them as three separate um, mini talks. Okay, so let's get started. Um, we'll discuss first this thing called ER equals EPR and quantum teleportation by black holes. So let's start with a brief review of quantum teleportation. Quantum teleportation is a quantum computation protocol which allows Alice over here um, to send a quantum state psi to Bob. And she does it not by just handing it to him directly. The rule is that all she's allowed to do is she's allowed to talk to him on the phone and send him some kind of classical information. And the goal is for her to send the quantum state. And as specified, that would be impossible. But the thing that makes it possible is the fact that Alice and Bob arrange in advance to, to share um, some entangled code books or entangled spins or something. And then it's possible for Alice to somehow use this entanglement together with a phone call to send the state. So this is a pretty cool algorithm or protocol that was invented in, in the early 90s. Here's a cartoon of how it works. Um, so. This is a very high level cartoon. I'm not going to show you the details, but um, roughly speaking, what Alice does is she takes her, her code book together with the quantum state that she wants to send. And she does a type of measurement on the two of them. The measurement is represented by this machine here and it gives um, some outcome. In this case, it gives outcome three, some number. She says to Bob over the phone, the combined measurement was three. Then Bob takes his half, his entangled code book, um, together with this measurement outcome three, puts it into a different machine, and um, out pops Alice's state. So I haven't shown you the details of this, but there's some simple manipulations that you can check um, to, show, to show that this works. And it's a pretty amazing algorithm, but there's something that you might wonder about, especially if you're well, I don't know what personal characteristics would lead you to wonder this, but you might wonder what it feels like to be the message and to be teleported. Um, Douglas, can I just say something? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just 
what you mean by a quantum state is not a, a psi written on a piece of paper. It, it's a system in the state psi. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that clarification. That's important. So in particular, Alice may not know what the state psi is. She has some physical system that is in state psi. And she can't just tell Bob the state because she might not herself know it. And if she measures the system, she might disturb it. So it's really a miracle that she's able to communicate the state to Bob without destroying it. And that's what this algorithm accomplishes. <clears throat> OK. But OK, so we, we, you could wonder what it feels like for the state side, for the system side to be teleported. And uh, well, we'll get back to that later. OK, so that was quantum teleportation. And it uses the way that quantum information theorists think about this is it uses the entanglement of the code books as a resource, a resource that allows you to do this amazing task, send quantum states. And a natural question is the following. Well, if entangled code books are a resource, what type of resource is a pair of entangled black holes? And in particular, can they be used to power quantum teleportation? OK, so this is the idea. This is what resource entangled black holes are supposed to represent. So here's a drawing of um, space with two black holes. Here's a rocket ship outside black hole one and another one outside black hole two. The dark shaded regions are supposed to be the interiors of the black holes. The horizons are somewhere around these circles here. And if the black holes are unentangled, then they look like this. They have separate interiors. Separate interiors you can fall into. But if the black holes are entangled, then the idea, the claim, is that um, the interiors of the black holes are connected geometrically by this object, which is called a wormhole. It's a connection between the interiors of these black holes. And this, uh, this wormhole is supposed to be the resource. So this idea, this connection between entanglement and wormholes um, it goes by the name of ER equals EPR, where it's sort of an inside physics joke. ER stands for Einstein Rosen, like the, who discovered this type of wormhole. And EPR stands for Einstein Podolsky and Rosen, who wrote a famous paper on quantum entanglement. And the equation is supposed to say that wormhole equals entanglement. If you have entanglement, you have a wormhole, and that's the resource that we're supposed to use to do quantum teleportation. OK. So to make the following discussion a little simpler, I'm going to simplify the geometry by cutting here between the two black holes. No, notice in this drawing, there's two ways, there's two types of connections between the black holes. There's a connection outside and a connection inside. We're going to cut the geometry like this, so there's only a connection inside. But as a proxy for the outside connection that previously existed, we're going to give Alice, who's over here, and Bob, who's over here, phones so that they can communicate with each other. <clears throat> The geometry which is cut in this way is just a little bit easier to represent um, uh, on the next slide. OK, so here's a space-time diagram. Could I, yeah. could I ask a question? Yeah, um, please. Really, a uh, really basic one, which is somehow there are a lot of, uh, like, like the, the black hole systems. I have some big black hole. I have you know uh, many states that live inside here. There must be some measure of I need like, like, are these maximally entangled black holes that I expect exhibit this property? And if so, what happens if I only have some partial entanglement? You know, what yeah. happens if I entangle yeah. a couple qubits and throw them in separate black holes? Yeah, that's a wonderful, wonderful question. And I think the idea is that to have a useful geometrical connection between the two, where classical concepts of geometry apply, you need to have a very large amount of entanglement between the black holes some amount of entanglement that's like proportional to one over Newton's constant. But um, in principle, even if you have a small amount of entanglement, there could be something like a quantum geometrical connection between the two. It just isn't very familiar from our usual concepts of geometry. For this discussion that I'm going to have here, it will be important that the black holes have a very large degree of entanglement. Um, a form of maximal entanglement, um, sort of close to maximal entanglement given the amount of energy that the two black holes have. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so, so, so the, so, so really all you're, 
you, you need maximal entanglement to have some concept of classicality here and have some control over these calculations, right? This is. Um, in or, you need a large amount of entanglement. I'm not going to say maximal, but you need a large amount of entanglement to have a classical geometry. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay. So <clears throat> here's the um, space time diagram of the same situation. Uh, time goes up, space goes sideways. Um, the region out here, this white region, is the region outside Alice's black hole. The region over here is the region outside Bob's black hole. And the gray region is the interior, the common interior of the two black holes. So the fact that you can go from here to there, there's a continuous line between the two here, represents the wormhole connecting the two exteriors. And um, this zigzag black line up here is the future singularity where uh, space-time ends. Okay, so um, here's Alice. She's following some world line, uniformly accelerated, which stays outside the black hole on the left. Here's Bob um, following a similarly accelerated trajectory, staying outside the other black hole. And the task that we want to do is Alice wants to send a quantum state to Bob. So, well, she realizes the resource is this wormhole, so she takes her first guess and just throws the quantum state into the wormhole. And um, it doesn't quite work because before the signal can cross through, cross the wormhole to Bob's side, the wormhole collapses and the quantum state hits a singularity. It's what's called a non-traversable wormhole. You can't make it from one side to the other. If you try, you'll hit the singularity before you get across. It's like a burning bridge or something that burns before you can make it to the other side. This is related to the fact that you can't send signals with entanglement alone. So now we come to the traversable wormhole protocol. So the way this works is we start with the same first step. Alice throws the quantum state into the black hole. Then a little while later, she measures a piece of Hawking radiation. This is analogous to the step in the previous protocol where the machine gave outcome three. She measures a piece of Hawking radiation and she tells Bob the result. The measurement creates some energy, some positive energy that falls into the black hole represented by this red line. She's disturbed the state of the black hole by measuring it and that's created some positive energy. She sends the result of her message to Bob. Based on the result, Bob can apply an operation on his side of the black hole that will send in a pulse of negative energy. Why he can do that, we'll explain in a second. But for now, it's possible using the information Alice gave him for Bob to send in some negative energy, this blue line. And when the message encounters the blue line, it suffers a negative time delay that allows it to make it across to the other side. So this time delay is related to a famous effect called the Shapiro time delay. It was one of the um, like four classic tests of general relativity in our solar system. Um, and what the Shapiro effect says is that um, signals get delayed a little bit if they pass near a massive object. Here, Bob has thrown in some negative energy. So instead of the signal getting delayed, the signal gets sped up a little bit. It has a time advance and it comes out a little sooner than it would have otherwise. It has a time advance like this. So it actually is able to cross the burning bridge and make it out to the other side. <clears throat> so that's actually the complete protocol. I wanna make two comments about it. So first, um, we should explain why Bob was able to create negative energy. Um, and this is related to a, a really cool property of, well, a fundamental property of quantum field theory, which is that in the low energy state or the, even the vacuum state, there are vacuum fluctuations, little fluctuations in energy happening all over the place. And if you could somehow clean up those fluctuations, remove the fluctuations, you would be able to lower the energy of the state. But you can't because you don't know whether the fluctuation is in a positive direction or a negative direction. So you don't know what to do. And if you try to measure it, you disturb it and raise the energy. What happens in this experiment is Alice over here, she measures a vacuum fluctuation. That's basically what Hawking radiation is. It's a vacuum fluctuation. She measures it and she knows, let's say, that it's in a positive direction. She tells Bob, 
Bob now knows that there was a positive fluctuation over here. And because of the entanglement of the two sides, he's likely to have a positive fluctuation on his side as well. So he has a good guess for what kind of operation to use to clean up the fluctuation. That turns out to be a good enough guess to lower the energy. So he's it makes it possible for him to create this negative pulse. <clears throat> the second comment is related to this question that we were asking about what it feels like to be quantum teleported. The amazing fact about this protocol is that it explains what's happening to the quantum state as it gets teleported. It goes from one side through the wormhole to the other side. And we can follow the experience of the matter. And it just feels like it's in free fall, floating in empty space time. So the experience of being teleported is basically no experience at all. So <clears throat> you know that um, this is something that, well, as long as you trust the people who are performing the teleportation, something that you could consider signing up for. OK, so the summary of this um, first part of the talk is um, what is Douglas? the risk? Yeah. Douglas, mm -hmm. why doesn't anything happen when it hits the negative energy pulse? Well, it depends on details of the negative energy pulse. But if it's in low enough dimensions, or if it's a spherically symmetric pulse, then you don't feel any tidal forces. And in a gravity theory, you just make it across smoothly. In string theory, you can have an unpleasant time. So your information could make it across, but you might feel some pain. But mm -hmm. in gravity, uh, the experience is perfectly pleasant. Um, Douglas, if uh, before uh, Alice falls in, if there is already some other matter falling in, then will, will, do you need to dramatically change the, the way to put in negative energy? Yeah, so if there, was <clears throat> if there was some previous matter that fell in, especially if it fell in a long time ago, the protocol just won't work. So you first need to remove that, and then you can make it work again. The reason why it won't work if previous matter fell in is that the previous matter will decrease the correlation between the left side and the right side. So the information Alice sends to Bob won't be useful to him anymore. OK, so. <clears throat> The resource associated to these entangled black holes is wormhole connecting them. And this helps with quantum teleportation because, well, the message goes through the wormhole. Um, how does it feel to be teleported? Just fine. OK, <clears throat> so this was one sort of application of, um, of wormholes in recent years to understanding quantum black hole physics. So I'm going to move on now to a second second application. It looks like there's a question in the chat. Ah, uh, how do I chat? Uh, I can just read it. It says, I have a question about the geometry on the previous slide. OK, please ask it. Not my question. <laughs> uh, well, if they ask, we'll come back to it. But um, <clears throat> so uh, the next part of the talk is about a subject called random matrix universality and black holes. So here's an example of a basic property of quantum systems that black holes are supposed to somehow represent. Uh, quantum systems um, have a discrete set of energy eigenvalues. And um, we could ask. If a black hole represents a quantum system, then where exactly do this discrete set of energy eigenvalues come from? How does a co continuous smooth space time or black hole hey, somehow Dad, produce a complicated set of discrete numbers? Yeah. The person asked the question Is it more appropriate to think about the zigzag as being in the particle path or in the shape of the event horizon? If you um, can answer this whenever you want, I guess. Okay, I think the question is about this zigzag up here and that's, oh, I'm not sure which is zigzag. So there's two zigzags. One is this black zigzag up here. That's the singularity. That's where the space time inside the black hole ends. No, I think, uh, I think the question is whether you should think the red line, the trajectory of Alice to be turned or whether the horizon is pushed back and uh, Alice. Oh, you can think about it either way. You, 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 you can think about it either way. It's a change of coordinates. So I'm using actually some kind of discontinuous coordinates here, but it's a little bit easier to think about. We could have drawn a different diagram where the horizon would move and the red line would be straight. 
And in some sense, that's a better set of coordinates. It just makes the point a little bit harder to make. I think that answers the person's next question, which is, does the negative energy cause the event horizon to briefly shrink? Well, it causes it to recede, in, but uh, whether the area gets bigger or smaller depends on details. <clears throat> OK. OK, so <clears throat> right. So here's a question. How does a black hole come up with a discrete set of um, energy eigenvalues? And the unfortunate answer is that we don't know. Um, but we have kind of a clue um, about what to look for. And the clue is based on the following. Black holes thermalize very efficiently. Um, and they display the butterfly effect. So to the extent that they represent quantum systems, they represent chaotic quantum systems. And in a chaotic quantum system, the statistics of energy eigenvalues are believed to universally resemble the statistics of eigenvalues of a random matrix. This is a conjecture that um, has a long history in, in physics, going back to um, Wigner. So what that means is a little bit complicated to describe, but here's a sort of a cartoon. Um, the black lines are supposed to be Poisson distributed, which means you just sort of throw random darts at this interval completely independently. The blue lines are periodic, exactly periodic. And the eigenvalues of a random matrix have a pattern which is somehow intermediate between the two, a degree of regularity which is intermediate between random numbers and um, periodic numbers. And this pattern has a number of mathematical features, which one of which we'll discuss. But if this behavior is supposed to be so universal, then it should also be true for the pattern of energy eigenvalues of the black hole. And even though we don't know what they are or how to compute them, they should have this property. And we can try to ask how to reproduce that in gravity. OK, so let's see how to go about um, thinking about these statistics. So if we're given a Hamiltonian of a quantum system, H, then um, let's imagine computing the thermal partition function, Z of x. It's the trace of e to the minus x times h. So this is the sum over all the energy eigenvalues of e to the minus x times the energy. And the function z of x is a type of generating function that encodes all the energy eigenvalues in a convenient way. Um, and so just to be concrete, we can imagine taking um, an example of a quantum many body system, an interacting quantum many body system, the SYK model that has been popular in recent years. The details of this model aren't too important. That's part of the point of random matrix universality. But it's a particular concrete quantum mechanical model, <clears throat> where these j's are some couplings that you multiply times an interaction of four fermions. The size represent Majorana fermions. The j's are a set of random interactions. Then if you take this um, function, z of x, then one way to probe the random matrix statistics, the correlation of eigenvalues, is to take two copies of the partition function. This is now a double sum over the spectrum. It's a product of two traces. So it's a sum over pairs of energy eigenvalues. And you plug in for x beta plus it and beta minus it for the two um, copies of this function z. So <clears throat> this can be considered a function of time t. And it goes by the name of the spectral form factor. It's been studied for decades in the context of quantum chaos and uh, random matrix statistics. If you just um, plot this function for the SYK model, then the function looks something like what's plotted below. So um, there's actually two things plotted below. There's a black line, which is smoother, and a very erratic red curve. The erratic red curve is the answer for a single specific instance of the SYK model, like a single particular quantum mechanical system. And these erratic um, wiggles are related to the specific set of energy eigenvalues in that system. The smoother black curve is some kind of average of that erratic function. So you can either average over time a little bit to wash out the wiggles, 
or even average by taking different realizations of these random couplings J. And the pattern, the shape of this function is, is very definite. It has these three regions, this initial decay called the slope, later linear rise called the ramp, and then a plateau. And this ramp behavior and plateau behavior are universal properties that come from random, that are characteristic of random matrix statistics. So pretty much any strongly interacting quantum system you take is going to have this ramp and plateau structure. In particular, a black hole should have this ramp and plateau structure. So this is another test that we want to do um, to check that black holes represent quantum many body systems. They need to have a ramp and a plateau. Okay, <clears throat> so can we reproduce these properties using a black hole? And a reasonable starting point to try to do this is to work with a simple two-dimensional black hole that is um, thought to be related to the SYK model. So here we can actually do some numerics and compute it in the SYK model. So maybe um, the simplest gravity theory is one that's related to this model. Okay, <clears throat> so this is slide is going to be just slightly technical, but not too bad. And we'll get back to um, the discussion in a second. So um, the theory of two-dimensional gravity we'll discuss is one called Jakeev tidal volume gravity. Um, and here's the action, the classical action for that theory. We have a parameter S naught, which we'll take to be large. So think of S naught as a very large number times the Euler characteristic. This is some topological invariant of the two-dimensional manifold. This action is supposed to be a function of the two-dimensional manifold. And uh, this term is a large number times the Euler characteristic. That's one term. The second term is um, it involves, it's sort of similar to the einstein hilbert action, except it has this field phi inserted. So we have the scalar curvature of the two-dimensional manifold. We have the volume element. And then we have a scalar field phi. So this altogether is a theory of one scalar field phi and two-dimensional metric g. And the goal of a quantum gravity theory is to evaluate the path integral, an integral over the scalar field phi and over the metric of this action. OK, so you can evaluate that integral in two steps. In a first step, um, you do an integral over the field phi. And if you do that on the right contour, then the integral over this term here um, gives a delta function constraint that says that the curvature has to be minus two everywhere. Phi is like a Lagrange multiplier that you're integrating over. And it sets the curvature to be minus two everywhere. What does that mean? It means that we're looking at a piece of two-dimensional hyperbolic space. That's the only space with um, r equals minus two, uniform negative curvature everywhere. And then in the second step, we're supposed to integrate over metrics. Um, and now the problem has simplified to integrating only over metrics that are pieces of hyperbolic space. So here's an example. Um, to compute z of x, this partition function that we defined before, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to put conditions that we're integrating over some space, which is um, has a boundary of length x. That's what the argument x in this function translates to, the length of the boundary of the region we're integrating over. And the constraint that um, we have a piece of hyperbolic space means that the possible spaces we can be integrating over are ones that look kind of like this. It's a piece of hyperbolic disk. That's this Escher drawing of angels and demons. And we've cut out a piece with um, length x. So <clears throat> the path integral that we're supposed to do to reproduce the z of x is an integral over all of these shapes with such that the length of the boundary is x. So this is actually a description of a two-dimensional Euclidean black hole. This disk here is a Euclidean or imaginary time black hole. And the path integral that we're doing over these wiggly boundaries is the path integral of a quantum mechanical black hole. OK, so that's the problem that we're supposed to be studying to compute z of x. And our goal is to plug that z of x in and get something that looks like this curve here. Okay, so the integral over these wiggly shapes isn't too hard to do. 
And um, you get the following function. It's a definite function, and it's this function here. The details of the function won't be super important, but uh, one aspect will. To compute the thing we're interested in, the spectral form factor, we're supposed to take two copies of this computation, two of these partition functions, and evaluate one of the x arguments as beta plus it, and the other x argument as beta minus it. And then we're supposed to take t large and look for some ramp and plateau behavior. But if you plug these arguments in and take two factors of this expression here, you find that when t is large, it approaches e to the 2s0 divided by t cubed. So that can give this initial decay here, this thing that's labeled the slope, but nothing more. It doesn't give the ramp, it doesn't give the plateau. So this is a version of a problem that was described a long time ago in a paper by Maldacena in 2001, that it doesn't look like the black hole. Um, th this type of correlation function just decays forever, one over t cubed, and it doesn't have any interesting ramp and plateau structure. So this is, looks like a problem. It looks like a problem for the description of a black hole as an ordinary quantum system. It's not describing this full curve. OK, so what, what are we missing in this calculation? Well, when we have two factors of this z of x, then we can have two separate disk type contributions, like what we just discussed. That was two factors of that function we had before. But you can also have something more interesting. You can have a wormhole, another type of negatively curved geometry that connects these two boundaries. And OK, so I wrote some math here. Um, the first expression is the answer for these two partition functions on these disk, just two products of the disk answer, the function that we wrote before. And um, the second thing, this expression here, um, is what you get by computing the wormhole contribution. And if you take this function and plug in beta plus it and beta minus it and take t large, then this first term is what we analyzed before. It becomes small at large time. The second term is growing. It's growing linearly in t. So together, these two contributions explain both the slope and the ramp portions of the spectral form factor plot. To describe the plateau is more complicated. That's a subject for another talk. But the wormhole here describes this ramp portion of this function. So <clears throat> something that I think is kind of interesting about this is that in retrospect, the computation of this function, of this curve here, and this linear ramp, it's like a numerical experiment, a numerical experiment that discovers a, a wormhole. So the explanation of this linear growth here is a wormhole connecting these two copies of the black hole together. And it was something that was discovered very concretely in this numerical computations, but it should be a universal feature of any quantum chaotic system. So to summarize this part of the talk, how does a black hole manifest random matrix statistics? It's supposed to be universal property of strongly interacting quantum systems. The answer is wormholes. And as a, um, a, another note to add here, um, in a beautiful paper from a few months ago, Phil Saad, a grad student here at Stanford, showed how a similar wormhole can be used to directly solve the problem as put forward in Malvasana's 2001 paper. OK, so I think I saw another. OK, so there was a question here. Um, asking questions in the chat is fine, but please also don't feel shy about just shouting out and interrupting. Um, but let's see. So the question is, what okay, is- so let me shout out and then okay. go out. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you took something which was manifestly a product of two things, and you did something to it and found out, uh-oh. <laughs> Am I still, he, hello, you still there? Yeah, 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 go okay. ahead. <laughs> you took something which was a Z times a Z, and it was yeah. manifestly, and now you got something which contains another term which doesn't factorize. Yes. So this is presumably associated with uh, with averaging over 
different theories. Yes. Yes. Somehow, can you, say, can you say a word? Can you say a word or two about um, about the relevance of these things for particular theories uh, versus for averaging over theories and what it means to average over theories? Should should we think that averaging over theories is the right thing to do in gravity? Okay. So this is a this is a great question and. Well, as you probably know, I don't have a great answer to it, but I'll say some things. Yeah. Um, so if we just take the gravity theory literally, we don't know from the definition whether it represents a quantum system or what exactly it represents. We just do calculations in gravity and then we try to interpret them. And the literal interpretation of this gravity theory is an ensemble. It's not a specific quantum system, it's an ensemble of quantum systems. So you can average out this red curve and give the smooth black curve. Gravity gives you the smooth black curve, which is the right answer for an ensemble of quantum systems. But it's the wrong answer for a single quantum system. OK, so now you can ask, um, what if I actually do believe that my black hole describes a, a specific quantum system? Is this result in contradiction to that? Or can it somehow be made compatible with that without any averaging? And I think for it to be made compatible, what you have to imagine is that in that theory, you would have this contribution, you'd have the wormhole, and then you'd have a whole bunch of other stuff that we don't understand at the moment. And that other stuff will correct the smooth curve to some erratic curve. So the other stuff, whatever it is, has to have zero time average. Mm -hmm. So that we get a simple answer after either averaging over time or averaging over theories. We isolate just the wormhole. But um, in principle, that other stuff is there as well. But in the end, you should get some factorized expression. Yeah, well, if, if the theory you're studying is really dual to a specific quantum system, then you must you absolutely must get a factorized expression. Yeah. So, so that would be magic. Well, it would be magic. That's but, not a criticism. It's just yeah. something we, we, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it would be magic. But, well, we've seen magic before, so. <clears throat> right. Well, I actually have I just, just a, just. I, could I um, also ask a question at this stage? So. Yeah. Um, these are beautiful calculations, you know, even just of the gravity part, as opposed to what you were just discussing. Um, are there any ambiguities there? And in particular, in historically, there were questions about the conformal factor in Euclidean quantum gravity. Um, this is a very special theory. Um, and, you know, it seems very compelling, but one wonders if the rules are or are not ambiguous and whether there's any danger of theoretical confirmation bias in these types of calculations. Or <laughs> um, could you just comment on that a little bit? You're asking how sure I am about the way that we analyze JT gravity, and maybe it could be analyzed in some other way. Or... Well, I, I, I mean, this is an old idea to use these Euclidean quantum gravity calculations in this problem, and that's, you know, yeah, it, yeah, it's great that it succeeded here. And one of the technical issues in the past was that the path integral wasn't obviously well defined because of the conformal factor. Um, okay, yeah, that, that's a problem. That's not a problem in JT gravity. In JT gravity, the path integral is really well defined. Like it, it makes 100% sense as a functional integral. Um, th that's a difference from higher dimensional gravity theories where not only there's the conformal factor problem, but there are UV problems. So you, you can't just say, you can't, in that case, you can't ask what does gravity literally answer for this question because the, the question doesn't make sense. In um, this theory, it makes literal sense. So we can make very confident statements like this theory is dual to an ensemble of theories. In higher dimensions, we can't. And I suspect, I suspect that that's related to the fact that in general, it's not an ensemble. But uh, in this case, it is. There's a question. One question. Of, I, oh, sorry. Okay. Let me just read these questions from the chat. So there was a question from Sharon Chaltikian, um, which I think is similar to the question that Lenny asked. So I'm going to assume that we don't need to go over that again. But if it, the question is different, please ask it again. Then there was a question from Steve Kivelson. What is the? What are we doing in expansion in here? I wrote something plus something else plus dot dot dots. Um, 
what makes the dots small. So the thing that makes the dots small is um, powers of e to the s naught. So I, s naught was this parameter that I told you we should think of as large. It's proportional to the entropy of the black hole. And the first two factors are proportional to e to the 2s naught. This factor is proportional to 1 in powers of e to the s naught. The next fact term that would appear here, which would be a thing like this with a handle in the middle of it, would be proportional to e to the minus 2s naught. So um, that's the answer to that question. That expansion breaks down at the plateau. So the plateau represents a breakdown of that expansion. OK, so. Um, um, yeah, Jonathan, one, before you, you go, yeah, yeah. Um, you partially already answered this. So one thing I should understand is that wormhole thing is, uh, should I imagine that it's coming from a subdominant saddle point in the calculation? It's a second saddle yeah, point I think contribution? That's a good way of thinking about it. It turns out technically that it's not a saddle point, but, it, but um, it's a reasonable way of thinking about it. Yeah, so the reason, so if, if, if that's true, then wasn't, and this is a bad way to phrase it. Shouldn't have you always expected that something like this should have happened? That may, would it would the expansion be able avail? Would you be able to carry on this expansion further off to perhaps get to the point where you can see the plateau? I guess that's my question. Well, and like other saddle point contributions be adding up or yeah. So what roughly what happens for the plateau is there's, there's a whole series here, and it's an asymptotic yeah. series, and the plateau is related to a non-perturbative effect that completes that asymptotic series. Right. So it, it somehow it isn't the plateau isn't really described by any term like this. No, no, I know. But I'm just wondering is do you is it possible to have complete control over the relevant saddles to maybe extend it to you can compute the plateau region? Or is it that is that just outside of the realm of possibility? Well, yeah, there's a kind of a weird trick that allows you to compute the plateau region just using these diagrams here reinterpreted. Okay. It's like in string theory, the way that you can calculate things about d brains just using perturbative string diagrams, even though d brains fundamentally represent a breakdown in the asymptotic okay. series of string perturbation theory. Thank you. OK. All right, so we're done with this second section. And we're going to move on to the third section now, um, which is a third application of wormholes in recent years, uh, in fact, in the last year, to computations of the entropy of Hawking radiation. So <clears throat> let's set this problem up. Here I've drawn a diagram, uh, yet another diagram that represents a black hole. I'm sorry, every part of this talk has a different diagram representing the black hole, but this is just the way things are. Uh, this is a space-time diagram that represents an evaporating black hole in flat space-time. So um, the blue line here is a some kind of constant time slice. So think of it as t equals 0. So this is space. Um, the dashed line is the horizon. So the region here on the other side of the dashed line is the interior of the black hole. And the region out here is the exterior of the black hole. And I should have drawn a um, singularity, like a jagged line here. This is the singularity. OK. So also on this diagram, we have some lines representing Hawking radiation. So Hawking radiation is built out of these vacuum fluctuations that we discussed earlier. And it, the way it works is you have a pair of correlated entangled vacuum fluctuations on the two sides of the horizon. One of them propagates out and becomes a real sort of recognizable particle far from the black hole. That's the Hawking particle that you would just encounter if you were near a black hole and it was radiating. The other one um, doesn't get out of the black hole and instead it just hits the singularity. But there are these two entangled particles. <clears throat> so what we want to think about is the um, entropy of all of the Hawking radiation, the entanglement entropy of the Hawking radiation. This particle that comes out is entangled with the particle behind the horizon, and so it has some non-zero entanglement entropy. As time passes and this spatial slice moves upwards, more Hawking radiation is produced, more Hawking radiation, more Hawking radi radiation, and so on. And if we look at the entropy of the Hawking radiation, we have sort of one half of each of these pairs. So the amount of entropy is growing proportional to the number of particles we have. So <clears throat> Hawking's, well, Hawking considered something similar to this. And uh, he did a type of calculation of the entropy of Hawking radiation. 
And what he found is something um, like what's plotted here at the right. The amount of entropy S in the Hawking radiation is just growing monotonically in time, proportional to the number of Hawking quanta. More precisely, what this curve represents is it's the thermal entropy of the Hawking radiation. Hawking radiation is um, well, <clears throat> purified by the interior partners of the Hawking radiation. So its entropy is just the total thermal entropy. So that's fine for a while. This curve is fine for a while. But um, eventually, it gets bigger than the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole. And the Hawking radiation is supposed to be entangled with the black hole, with the interior partners. And if the black hole has a thermodynamic entropy, S black hole, then it can't possibly have more than S black hole entanglement with any other system. So at the point where these lines cross, we have a problem. At early times, the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole is huge, and the entropy of the Hawking radiation is small, so there's no contradiction. But at late times, it looks like the entropy of Hawking radiation will be bigger than the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole, and that would be a problem. In particular, what will be a, it be a problem for? It will be a problem for the hypothesis that the black hole represents an ordinary quantum system ordinary quantum system that can be entangled with only s, the thermodynamic s amount of entropy. So, okay, so uh, Don Page in the early 90s was thinking about this problem, and he proposed that what the right answer should be is the minimum of these two curves. So a function that looks like that. Minimum of the answer that Hawking got, and this limit that we get from the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole. So this function that goes up and then goes down again has become known as the page curve. Why does it go down? It goes down because the black hole is getting smaller. It's, it's evaporating. It's getting smaller. And so its thermodynamic entropy is decreasing with time. So its capacity to be entangled with any other system is decreasing with time. So this limit is decreasing with time. And um, Page's answer respected that decrease. So question, how are we supposed to derive this answer in gravity? So for many years, it was thought that in order to do that, we'll need a very sophisticated quantum theory of a black hole. Um, and only in the last year, um, starting with work by um, uh, Jeff Pennington, a grad student here at Stanford, and Ahmed Almhiri, Netta Engelhart, Don Merolf, and Henry Maxfield, um, did they actually try to do the calculation? So let's discuss briefly what's involved in the calculation. Now, I'm going to describe this in an ahistorical way, but I'll correct the history in a moment. So the entropy of any system, von Neumann entropy, is defined as follows. S is minus trace of rho log rho, where rho is the density matrix. Mathematically, that can be represented as the derivative with respect to n of trace of rho to the n, evaluated when n is equal to 1. So the way that um, um, professionals compute this is to first compute, consider the computation of trace of rho to the n for an arbitrary integer n. And then you analytically continue near n equals 1. I say near n equals 1, not exactly n equals 1, because you're supposed to take a derivative. You can think about the answer is coming from a region infinitesimally close to n equals 1. This is called the replica trick, because the different factors of rho in rho to the n are replicas of the original system. Rho represents the quantum system. Rho squared would represent two copies of the quantum system. So for integer n, um, we need n replicas of black hole geometry. And we need to do some calculation with those n replicas. In Hawking's calculation, he was implicitly assuming that those n copies, those n replicas, are disconnected from each other, geometrically disconnected, not connected by space-time geometry. But we can also consider a configuration in which the n replicas are connected together by um, what else? A wormhole. This is known as a, a replica wormhole because it's a wormhole connecting together these n replicas in the computation of the entropy. 
Okay. So drawing the wormhole is a challenge that I failed. Um, I, I can't draw it. So what I'm going to do is draw, explain sort of how you can do this computation, even though you can't draw the wormhole. Uh, so I'll draw simpler geometry and explain um, what simplifies when n comes close to 1. So let's imagine that we have a family of geometries that look like this for integer n. Um, I'm not saying these geometries are a solution to anything. It's just supposed to be a sketch that helps you understand something special about the limit n goes to 1. So, but what the parameter n represents is the number of these boundaries with black lines. So here's a boundary with one black line. Here's one with two black lines. Here's one with six black lines. And they're connected together. They're all connected together. Um, and we're going to think about these black lines as the different replicas of the system. And the connection between them is a replica wormhole. So these are geometries that represent a replica wormhole. Connections, geometrical connections, between these, um, in this case, six different black boundaries. Okay, so we're supposed to do some kind of a computation with geometries like this, with replica wormhole geometries, and then we're supposed to take a limit when n is very close to one. And um, that doesn't make any sense because n is obviously a discrete number here. It's the number of these boundaries. And I don't know how to take n to be close to one in a computation where we're discussing a discrete number of boundaries. Sorry, close to one, but not equal to one. But the trick is the following. You can notice that these geometries have a Zn rotation symmetry. So this one has rotation by 180 degrees, and this one has rotation by 2 pi over 6. Um, and if we quotient by that Zn symmetry, then we get geometries that look like this. So we identify by the Zn symmetry, and then we get the n equals 1 case isn't modified at all. The n equals 2 case, we just get half of this diagram with an identification between these two dotted lines. The n equals 6 case, we get 1 sixth of this diagram, again, with an identification between these two dotted lines. And to basically, to do the full computation involving this full unquotiented wormhole, roughly speaking, you just multiply by n. You consider these quotiented geometries and then multiply by n. And the point of doing this quotient is that the result of the quotient can be continued in n. It makes sense to talk about n that's close to 1 but not equal to 1 for these geometries. So here I drew this geometry when n is equal to 1.1. It looks almost like this thing here, but we have um, a small opening angle um, and, um, at the location, starting at the location of the black dot. Here's when one, n is equal to 1 plus epsilon, we have an infinitesimal opening angle. In the limit where n approaches 1 from above, um, or approaches 1 from a continuous value, then we get the n equals 1 geometry, but it's marked. There's a marked point on that geometry. That marked point is this black point here. The black point was originally the fixed point of the Zn symmetry. It was like the center of this rotation of this object. And the limit n goes to 1 remembers that um, fixed point. So it, there's, um, the if you like, the residue of this replica wormhole in the limit n goes to 1 is just the identification of this one point in the geometry. So <clears throat> n very close to 1 is the same as n equals 1 plus an identification of a point on the geometry. OK, so that's the philosophy of how you continue a computation involving a replica wormhole with n boundaries to, um, to compute the von Neumann entropy, to take this limit. n goes to 1 of the derivative of this quantity. So in this evaporating black hole case, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to find some kind of a replica wormhole connecting together n copies of this geometry. I can't draw that replica wormhole for you. Um, but luckily, I don't need to. To do the computation of the entropy, all I need to do is tell you where the residue of that replica wormhole is, the, this dot, this marked point on the n equals 1 geometry. OK. And what that looks like is the following. It looks like some point just a little bit inside the, um, inside the horizon of the black hole. 
this is the residue of the replica wormhole. It looks like an ordinary point on the evaporating black hole geometry, but secretly it's a reminder of the fact that we're doing a computation with these wormholes. So this point um, goes by the name of the a quantum extremal surface, and you can use it to compute the entropy of the, of the density matrix. And the way you do it is you just evaluate the area of this surface. In higher dimensions, this point is a surface. Um, it's a co-dimension two surface, and the entropy is the area of that surface. So <clears throat> this computation uh, of the area reproduces the page formula for the entropy. It gives this answer that goes up. And then, so when it goes up, it's when the disconnected geometries are winning. And then when it starts to go down again, it's because the replica wormhole geometries are dominating. And in the region where the replica wormholes are dominating, the entropy just becomes the, um, the area of this surface, which tracks the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole. OK, so a mini summary of this final part of the talk is um, the following. There was a question after Page's paper, or even before it, which was, what did Hawking miss in his calculation of the entropy? And preliminary answer. Douglas, um, can I ask a question? Yeah. Is that all of, as a summary of all of that, that you calculate the entropy by differentiating with respect to a little conical deficit? Yeah, but you need to say where the conical deficit is. Um, at the horizon. Well, but you're not sure where it's supposed to be. And uh, the, so the important point is that in this geometry here, there's some equations of motion for the replica wormhole. Uh -huh. And the residue, as n goes to 1 plus epsilon of those equations of motion, implies something about where this dot is allowed to sit. And the thing that they imply is that it has to be what's called a quantum extremal surface. So you're not allowed to just say, well, look, the dot should be at the horizon. You need to show that the horizon is, or this location here is a quantum extremal surface. And that's exactly the calculation that was done in these papers um, a year ago this month. Hmm. Okay. What wasn't immediately clear from that calculation was that, you know, why we're supposed to be computing the, why we're supposed to be computing some property of this quantum extremal surface. Mm -hmm. That was justified in this later work um, about the replica wormholes. Okay. Okay, so a tentative answer to what Hawking missed in his calculation of the entropy um, is that he forgot to include wormholes. And there's sort of a pattern in this talk of confronting problems with black holes and their relation to quantum mechanics and discovering that you just forgot to put a wormhole somewhere. So this has been um, kind of an exciting thing over the last few years to see tensions in black hole physics and its relation to quantum mechanics get slowly chipped away at by just taking whatever calculation you were doing before and trying to add a wormhole to it. So the final thing, I, rather than putting a summary, I um, wanted to put a puzzle, puzzle here, which is um, actually something that we've already discussed in response to a question Lenny asked. Um, that the wormhole can give you a smoothed version of this curve, but not the erratic red curve. And at the moment, we have no idea where the erratic red curve could come from. Um, we don't know where that information is hiding in the theory of a black hole, where it's hiding in the space-time description of a black hole. But, um, well, stay tuned. We're working on it. So um, that's all I've got. Uh, thanks very much for uh, your attention and for the questions. Douglas? Yeah. In a theory, not SYK, not the theory of uh, two-dimensional black holes, but a theory perhaps based on some very, very particular holographic field theory, do we have reason to believe that the actual curve is erratic? Yes. Oh, you say that's a general feature of all quantum systems? Of yes. Size. Ah, yes. Okay. So, we, so even in those theories for which there's no reason to be averaging over an ensemble, we expect that the actual 
instance by instant curve should be this erratic thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we expect that with like an exceptionally high degree of confidence. Yeah, yeah, no, that's so clear. Good. Well, I think Roger raised his hand. Okay. I, just please feel free to just go for it when you have a question. Okay. Uh, very interesting talk, Douglas. Um, uh, I, I, I'm wormholes are sort of obviously the center of this, and I'm trying to quite understand your attitude to how do you keep them. If you look at them classically, you can't keep them open for very long. Quantum mechanically, the rules are different, as you explained. Um, how do you actually see the wormhole as um, you know, as part of a, almost a classical space time on which you're doing this quantum mechanics, in particular in the first part of the talk with the um, quantum information and so on? Um, so in the, the first part, the traversable, so in the quantum teleportation discussion, it's a case where the wormhole is, as you say, it doesn't stay around for very long. And all that the quantum teleportation protocol does is it preserves it for an instant longer. And that makes it possible to use it to, well, to cross it. So it's, in a sense, the quantum mechanics has a very small effect, which means that the wormhole can live a little bit longer and you can cross it. In the later parts of the talk, we were discussing wormholes that, um, wormholes that are in a sense describing very small effects. So they're not the leading description of the black hole, but there's some small quantum effect in the description of the black hole, like the correlations of the eigenvalues or the um, exact quantum entropy that's sensitive to very small effects. And those small effects are described by some instanton-like correction in the black hole geometry. And that's what the wormhole is. It's like a tiny, um, non-perturbatively small correction to the black hole, uh, which has important qualitative consequences. And so what you were saying, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that you know, Hawking radiation was originally posited as a, <clears throat> You know, quantum mechanics on a, on a classical space time, uh, and then these paradoxes arose, which you you and your colleagues have spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, and you're saying the resolution of these very tiny effects with the wormholes will get you out of those difficulties. Is is that a, a sort of low level yes. summary? Yes, that's right. It's worth saying that the wormholes don't so far get you out completely because they don't explain structure like these wiggles or the erratic behavior. So it's like they kind of tell you that the entropy is supposed to go down, but they don't allow you to compute the actual state. It's like Hawking's calculation is more than just a computation of the entropy. It's a computation of a final state of the Hawking radiation. And the wormholes were able to compute the entropy and show that the entropy goes down, but we're not able to compute the state. So it's like the, it gets us part of the way to an answer, but not the whole way. Okay, but, thank you, that helped. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> uh, Monica, please feel free. Yeah, so um, in the this calculation of the spectral form factor, Yeah. Uh, you explained that in the gravity calculation, leaving out the wormhole makes you fail to see this ramp. And I'm wondering if I were to do this calculation from a Hamiltonian for a strongly interacting quantum system, is there an analogous um, approximation I could make or thing that I leave out that makes me fail to capture the ramp and see only that initial decay? Okay. Um, that's a... That's a um, interesting question. I, I don't have a good answer to it, partly because it's act if you start with some kind of generic Hamiltonian system, it's actually really hard to compute this spectral form factor. So it's like one of these things that we kind of know is true, that it should have universal random matrix statistics, but we don't know how to show it by some direct calculation. So like in the SYK computations, we just did numerics. And the numerics don't say, well, here's the naive answer, and then here's the right answer. It just gives you the exact answer. And we don't really have a general purpose tool 
in Hamiltonian systems for computing the spectral form factor. So it's, um, there maybe, are sorry, some, yeah. Maybe related to that, is there an interpretation on the quantum side of what that ramp means? Or well, what it, okay, I'll give two answers to that. So in terms of the eigenvalues, what it means is it means that there's this long range kind of repulsive anti-correlation of the eigenvalues and it diagnoses that. It's like a power law. So it's some long range anti-correlation between the eigenvalues and it, it re represents that statistical property. But in terms of the physical system, there are some cases where you do have a way of computing a spectral form factor, like special problems, like a quantum system that corresponds to a particle moving inside a chaotic billiard stadium. And in that case, what the ramp represents is a particular type of contribution from long periodic orbits and uh, in the orbit expansion of the partition function. So in that case, you have a, a description for what it is, but more generally, you don't really have a way of computing it. I think it's probably related. I feel like there should be a more general theory where it's related to, um, related to properties of, of an entangled state between the two copies of the system. So the spectral form factor is a two replica system. And I think this ramp should be related to an entangled state that represents the wormhole. But that hasn't been made precise except in special examples. Thanks. Can I ask Monica's question? I think it's Monica's question and it's in a different way. Is it likely that these gravitational tools will become the kind of general purpose tools that will allow us to calculate these things for chaotic systems that we can't calculate now? Um, words, let's, let's forget about thinking about, uh, 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 what's about black holes as the, end, uh, as the end of the whole story. Is it possible that black holes and general relativity will themselves provide general purpose tools for problems which at present are too hard to solve? I feel like they might provide examples, but they, it's a special, the gravity theory, as you know, is it's like a special point. The, the more general, general purpose tool that we need is something like string field theory. And um, I don't know if that's ever going to be a practical general purpose tool, but um, it has as a special limit gravity. So, so, but given a special limit, which you know how to solve, you could try working away from it. Well, sure, you could try to do, you could try to do perturbation theory. Um, but I feel like the more general, the more useful thing is may, might not be as a quantitative theory, but just as a, an example of like an inspirational example to see, to see how it can work. Maybe we'll get a quantitative theory. Maybe we'll figure out string field theory in like a in a practical way, or figure out even how to do string perturbation theory more generally in a practical way. But... Yeah. Well, it might provide it might provide ways of uh, of new ideas for ways of thinking about things without actually providing a uh, you know really high quality computational tool, but yeah. some conceptual ideas. Well, yeah, but I mean, yes, absolutely. But I mean, black holes have a history of doing that. That that has already been happening. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions. We asked quite a few during. Um, well, are there any last questions? If not, um. Thank you very much for the talk and let's thank Douglas. Yeah, thanks you guys. Thanks for the questions. Please unmute now and thank Douglas. <laughs> <laughs>